um, but exactly what is, is, is not defined, but what the country is going to do is set out in the NDC. So the important part of the, um, this in net zero terms is the, the Paris Agreement did not use the phrase net zero, um, but in the NDCs that I've just sort of described, um, governments are starting to use the term net zero as part of these NDCs. So as part of the commitment that's come out of the Paris Agreement, um, it's sort of not, not really being translated, but it's being explained in, in a net zero target term. So, th so this is one of the starting points. <clears throat> also, the, the 2018 IPCC report. Um, so this is another key, key part. Um, so this warned um, slightly more strongly that emissions must not exceed one and a half degrees uh, to avoid the most catastrophic impacts and to achieve this so, so what i've got on the screen there um so this this introduces a couple of key elements as well so to um to prevent the temperature rising to two one half degrees emissions need to fall by about 45 percent by 2030 and reaching net zero around 2050 so this is where the net zero term comes from and we'll come back to these points and these dates. So, so 45% by 2030 is it sets an interim target. We'll talk about interim targets in a, more detail. And yeah, the net zero term is, is now here uh, with that 2050 date. So that's the origin. So yeah, is there a definition of net zero? I mean, there, there isn't a sort of formal definition, but there's a couple of things again on the screen here. Um, so, so to describe the concept in more detail, so greenhouse gases are reduced to a minimum and any remaining emissions are removed. So there's another key couple of key terms that we're going to come back to. So it's talking about reductions and then removals. Um, the net zero, uh, might be fairly obvious, um, means that the, the greenhouse gas emissions produced and the amount removed are equal. So there's a balance. Um, and th this concept of the, of the net, so that there being this balance, um, it's important because it would be difficult to reduce all emissions to zero. So that that's sort of viewed as almost sort of simply being not um, not possible, I guess. So it's about this balance, but it's really about these key phrases of, of reducing and then removing. So, um, I think again, probably everyone's familiar with with the with the problem, but so but just a quick slide on this. So what's the problem again? So a couple of charts here. Apologies, one is one is slightly covered, but. Um, you basically have the so this is the average surface temperature globally and this on the the, the black chart here is emission um so yes it's very very obviously we put a, i put an orange bar here around 1960 and it sort of i suppose states states the obvious that temperature is going up as emissions are going up and i think we probably will understand that so we won't won't labor that point um but it was right widely reported this week i think it was tuesday um, that 2023 is virtually certain to be the world's warmest year on record, um, the previous one being 2016. So, yes, like I said, we're probably all pretty familiar with that. So um, a similar chart, uh, but this is um, temperature pathways or sort of um, temp yeah, sorry, temperature pathways um, showing various scenarios. Uh, if we do nothing, I'm, sorry, I'm not going to labour this this one, um, but but just very briefly. Uh, if we do nothing, applies a sort of four degree temperature rise. Current policies, if emissions reduce slightly, so we're coming up to two and a half, three degrees. Uh, and ideally, so this is the what we were talking about initially, the two degree and the one and a half degree pathway. And these imply a significant reduction in emissions. So I, I hope you can see the mouse. But so two things to focus on here. One of them is, is the left axis. Um, so this is the, the actual greenhouse gas emissions in gigatons or billion tons. So focus on this. I think this number here, 50 billion tons a year. And then also sort of focusing on the shape of the curve, um, which is missing someone into the lobby. So the shape of the curve here. So we'll, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about this. So I want to introduce the um, concept of the, the carbon budget, which I will now endeavour to explain. So this is where the, the 50 gigatons a year is important in terms of the carbon, the carbon budget. So carbon budget, the maximum amount of carbon that can be emitted to keep the temperature rise under a set amount. So if the set amount is one and a half or, or two degrees, obviously a slightly different budget there. 
Um, but we have to get this concept in our head. Um, it's important in terms of um, interim targets and the sort of total volume of carbon that can be reduced. So at that amount I mentioned, sort of 50 billion tonnes a year, um, there's some Imperial College analysis uh, earlier, uh, when it was October this year, um, that they said there was a, a tiny amount left was how it was reported. Um, 250 billion tonnes was the amount. I don't know if that's tiny, but in, in global terms, I think, um, yes, a very small amount, especially if you're emitting 50, 50 billion tonnes a year or thereabouts. So with some reductions, um, it, that implies a need to get to net zero by 2034, which clearly isn't very far away. And that, But that's for a one and a half degree um, temperature rise. So... Um, really sort of hammering home the, this point that um, something needs to be done. Um, there are some, I don't want to go into the, into the sort of technical details, but um, a lot of these numbers depend on this confidence level. Um, so there's the predictions and, and probabilities. Um, if you, instead of one and a half degrees, change to two degrees and with a with a 66% confidence uh, level of remaining under that temperature, um, that can be achieved um, with net zero by 2050. So there's quite a lot of sort of, uh, if you use the term, I don't know if it's flexibility or sort of variation, even from one and a half degrees to two degrees. Um, but yes, the, the point being that I think we all understand that um, again, some, something needs to be done. But um, so the point, that's the point I really want to make about the carbon budget, um, because this is very important for the net zero concept is whether you're going over or under budget, under budget being very unlikely. Um, but if uh, if you're emitting too much initially, um, the starting point here, you may get to net zero at the end, but but along the way, uh, you have basically emitted too much carbon. So you've gone over that budget. So if it's 250 billion tonnes remaining or even 500 billion tonnes remaining, if you go over that, it doesn't matter in a way when you go over that, if you do go over that, then there's too much carbon in the atmosphere uh, and you're going to go over your temperature budget, sorry, temperature limit. When, so whenever that um, occurs. So. One more chart on that, so just to try and try and hammer that point home. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is where if you're over budget at the start, it implies. So for every year you're going over budget. You're going to have to go under budget at some point. Otherwise, all this carbon is then in the atmosphere. So even if you did that, and then it was, I hope you, hopefully you can see the mouse, if you went over budget and then down the curve, you've still emitted too much. Um, so even if you get to net zero at 2050, there's all of this carbon in the atmosphere that, that you did, didn't want there um, to, to stay under your temperature rise. So, uh, yeah, you imply you have to go under budget at some point. And, and the way things are going, that is incredibly unlikely. So it's a really key point, um, and we'll talk about interim targets, but that, that this is sort of where they come from, that you have to have interim targets to, to stay on this line so you don't so you don't go above. Okay, I hope that, that makes sense. You can fire a question in uh, if not. Um, so yes, so what needs to be done in, in a sort of mini summary? Um, so this is sort of to stay on that line. So emissions must decline by 45% by 2030. Um, so that did come out of the IPCC report. So that's um, that's your reduction. Um, and they must reach net zero by 2050. So that would involve reduction, but also this concept of removals, which will come, come to you later. And, and I've probably said it many times already, but the, the concept of interim targets. So there should be interim targets every five years to make sure things are on track and you're not going to go over budget. Um, and there's a little stat there from the SPTI, the Science Based Targets Initiative. Uh, so their net zero standard, most companies in the world will need to reduce their emissions by 90 to 95% by 2050. So again, that, that sort of hammers home the, the idea of, of reductions. So we'll explain a little bit more about that, talking about a uh, little bit of terminology. Um, about the difference between reductions and removals and offsets with the term carbon neutral. Um, when we see some examples, you'll see some of the things that companies say um, that can be confused. They can use carbon neutral or net zero interchangeably. So let's try and explain the difference. Um, 
So net zero focuses on reducing emissions to the lowest amount first, and then essentially offsetting as a last resort. So reduce first, then remove, and then, then offset as a last resort. Carbon neutrality, as it's generally described, is focused on offsetting. Um, there's a bit more to it than that in, in some sort of uh, definition, some phase of looking at so the carbon trust. Um, a net zero target must include scope one, two, and three. And carbon neutrality can be a little bit more loose than that in terms of only requiring scope one and two. Scope three is encouraged, but sort of not, not generally built in. Um, I think at the moment, the carbon trust are. are uh, I think the term is transitioning their their carbon neutral verification to have a more focus on on reductions, kind of for this for this reason. But but that's that's sort of the essential difference. Um, net zero also should refer to all greenhouse gas emissions, ideally. Um, and carbon neutral is obviously referring to carbon, uh, but then we must sort of uh, reflect or point out that for a lot of companies, probably most companies. Uh, their greenhouse gas emissions are in fact carbon. So for some, there's methane and, and others, um, but the, the majority, I think it's we're talking about carbon. OK, so a little chart coming up on the next slide to um, explain one of the one of the issues with carbon neutrality. So the, the, the problem, hopefully this can illustrate um, both of these uh, charts you, you have emissions um, and so at the top and then the offset at the bottom. So both of these are carbon neutral. So this one is sort of business as usual, emissions increasing. So why why can't you just sort of offset more and more um, the carbon? And that, that is carbon neutral. That's that's OK, isn't it? Um, but the problem with that, I think one of the, the main ones, it, it, it seems you can actually offset this much carbon. Um, talk about sort of methods. A bit, but um, even if you're if you're planting trees, you know, is there enough land? I think the the, the general uh, generally understood that, that that there isn't. You you can't just go on with the business as usual situation, and and offset by planting trees and and using technology. So there has to be uh, some reduction. So this is where if, when we start looking at companies and they say we're gonna, we're pledged to be carbon neutral by um, by 2050, for example, or even, or 2030 drilling down into what they're really saying. Do they mean carbon neutral? Or are they just offsetting? So this is where it becomes becomes important. OK, so let's um, we we'll talk about. I've talked about reductions, but how do you do it um, again? I, I, I think probably most people are going to be fairly familiar with with the, the overall concept. There, there's some easy switches, um, obviously switching out of fossil fuels to renewables, energy efficiency and reducing waste. Um, and, and how energy is used. Um, the bigger cuts that are going to be needed, so that's where it gets more difficult. Excuse me. Um, so look at um, a long phrase there, but it basically means new technologies, investment and innovation into um, less fossil fuel intensive technologies. And focusing on on key sectors, uh, I suppose that's also fairly obvious sectors like heating, transport, agriculture, or the gas is another another obvious one to get those those bigger cuts that are needed. So that's that's a brief overview of what you can do about reductions. And then if we're talking about removals and offsetting, um, nature-based solutions, planting trees, um, is probably the one most people think of or, or have heard of uh, increasing wetlands and land management changes. So this is all about increasing the amount of carbon sequestered into the soil. So a removal is um, we talk about long term locking up the carbon. Uh, that could be another difference with with offsetting. Um, and then technical technological solutions such as uh, well the other phrase for this negative emissions technology. Um, which is a good one, um, but so yeah, technological solutions such as carbon capture. There are other acronyms. Uh, there's direct air capture, uh, DAC, bioenergy, and with carbon capture. So without going into the details of these, um, BECCS, and one of our examples, companies is using these. Um, so it all sounds good on paper, um, these technological solutions, but at the moment they're not being done on a large scale. 
uh, and they can be expensive and they can also be quite energy intensive in themselves. So uh, at the moment, um, not quite the panacea that, that we need or the, the significant shift that we need, um, but they are there and they're being invested in. So yeah, a little bit more about offsets, um, carbon credits, just briefly. Um, some of the problems with this, or, or one of the main problems, is that the credibility of these of some of the schemes is being questioned. So if you if you are just relying on offsets, um, particularly if it's planting the trees, you know, are they are they really being planted? Are they growing as expected? Uh, and I also was reading about a scheme this week. Um, that was based on prevent rather than planting trees. It was based on preventing deforestation. So we don't if we don't cut down those trees, then then sort of that's okay. That well, it, it will help to offset carbon. But um, saying things like it, it's okay to fly more planes if we don't cut down those trees is kind of not the approach we're looking for. <laughs> fairly obviously. So the, that the credibility of offsets as a method uh, being yeah being questioned. Um, and some of the standardisation of how it's done and the, and the terminology is it can be a bit confusing and it's, it's still evolving with these methods. Um, but having said all that, uh, there is an argument that you will, there's still be a place for some offset, but it's, it's minimising it, I've kind of alluded to. So there, there will be always be residual emissions, so those that cannot be reduced or removed. Um, and at that point, uh, that's where offset could be coming in when you when you've done all the other work to to reduce or remove as much as possible. Okay, so moving on, um, a little bit of summary of what what I've just sort of run through fairly quickly. Um, so you see a lot of sort of negative news about about carbon um but the fact is that global emissions are not reducing quickly enough so if you think back to the over budget curve that's kind of where we're at um and it is true that instead of being on track to reduce emissions by 45 percent um they're actually still increasing and set to increase um by 11 percent um on top of that or alongside that there's been an influx of net zero commitments um, in, in terms of GDP, more than 90% of global GDP is now said to be committed to net zero. So that's talking about country commitments rather than company commitments. Um, well, I think I've got I have some stats about the number of companies. Um, if that question gets asked. Um, and then just a final point there. At COP27, so the last COP, um, UN General Secretary called for zero tolerance on net zero greenwashing. So given the confusion and lack of credibility prevalent in corporate net zero pledges. So this is um, so this is really the problem and what we'll start looking at in the, in the second part. Um, it's, it's very easy to make a commitment. <clears throat> it can almost be as simple as, uh, of course, we'll be net zero by 2050. Um, in a way, anyone could sort of say that, but it's how are you going to implement that? What's your, what's your plan? So, we'll, so that's what we'll look at in the second half. And as Jim said, so now we're talking about yeah, um, how do we translate these problems um, into action? What the companies need to do? Um, what's good and bad? And uh, and yeah, what's going on? So. What do companies need to do? I mean, in, in a way, this sort of repeats some of the um, the dates and, and the targets. Um, so I hope it's not saying the obvious, but um, if you're looking at a company and, and they have an expectation of what you'd like to see, so so this is it. So um, committing to net zero by 2050, so that this is the sort of easy commitment that sort of anyone could say, like you said, um, of course we'll do that. Um, but covering the entire value chain it's called or which is scope one two and three so particularly the supply chain um, for some companies that is clearly important so so making that initial commitment setting out um, the transition plan often called a net zero roadmap so this is the next step in terms of okay we made the commitment but starting to think about how we're actually going to do this interim targets are clearly important like i've probably said more than once 
um, making sure you're not going to contribute to going over budget. Ideally, set every five years in line with the IPCC recommendation uh, and also covering all scopes. And then when so when you've when you've done this, so this is your plan and your targets for so that's re reductions. Uh, and thinking about what is left, so these are the residual emissions, and focusing on removal of those and the permanence being that. So that's a sequest sequestration, locking that carbon up for the for the long term, ideally forever. Um, so it's having this having this plan and sort of even calculating should be calculating what those residual emissions might be. Acknowledging that's quite difficult to do, um, and also there are. Um, many net zero focus groups and organisations, um, which is all about sort of collaboration and transparency. So being being part of those is another factor. So when we do our assessment, um, it's really sort of it's focusing on those areas. We divide it into four. So so what's the commitment and the plan to achieve it? Um, what reductions are are in there? The interim targets again. Um, what's the plan for residual emissions? Have they been calculated? And yeah, what are those memberships? Uh, a part of this, um, there was a there was another webinar yesterday. I don't know if anyone saw it. it was a Reuters webinar, which was also about net zero, but it was actually talking to companies. I think it was Danone and uh, Procter and Gamble, P and G. And one of the points from that was, um, which I'll sort of throw in here, was it was basically acknowledging it, it's not easy. So they were talking about, um, you know, again, it's easy to come in, it's easy to even sort of write these steps down, but in practice it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, and if you go back to the date again, um, 2018, and it's not, it's not that long ago, if you take that date as the sort of start of net zero, that IPCC report, it's not that long for sort of giant global companies to, to start doing things. Um, it's not too... Not to say they, they shouldn't, uh, but especially um, you know, part of the talk yesterday was in in the supply chain. So acknowledging when you're talking about scope three emissions in in the supply chain and how they may be may be reduced, um, it can be difficult. There was uh, one of the examples with transportation. Uh, if you have a, a sort of on time supply chain and your your ideal, more sustainable. Uh, transport solution is not available, but you still have to get that product out on time. You might just have to switch to a less sustainable solution. And those sorts of issues are very, very difficult to address. So the good thing about this is it's obviously all being being thought about, but these are things that need to be um, considered. It's not, as, you know, on the surface, it, it looks quite simple. Yes, you know, do a plan and reduce your emissions. Lots of things need to occur. So a little bit more detail about what we look for. So in the commitment, um, so we we divide it up into so net zero greenhouse gases. So that's if the company has mentioned all of their emissions. And as we said earlier, um, it is commonly just carbon, but for some companies not. So, so have they taken that on board? So there's net zero greenhouse gases, net zero carbon, or are they really talking about being carbon neutral? So I've got quite a good example of that coming up. So it's sort of what's what's their focus? Have they sort of taken it all on board? Um, the time frames clearly important. That that's just noting the dates that they've got. And a lot of companies, I think, now are, are sort of went on board with the 2030s and the 2050 dates, um, and and trying to make it earlier. Uh, then looking at the the plan in more detail. So again, this is our sort of notes. So there'll be a narrative on on exactly what they're doing. Whether there's a roadmap. Um, the, the sort of easy things we talked about earlier, switching to renewable electricity, that's that's very common. Uh, transitioning to electric feet, fleet, electric feet. Mm. <laughs> um, it's just sort of easy, easy steps. Um, and then there's there's talk about part of the plan being investing in the carbon capture technology, etc. Um, again, simple things as part of their commitment is a specific overall target. Is the company actually? how specific are they being and quite a key one again that I've, I've mentioned whether the residual emissions are acknowledged so there can be a lot of talk about re reducing which is great um, but then sort of not acknowledging that there's always going to be some that, that you can't um, reduce and what are you going to do about those 
is there a plan there? So um, here's an example. I hope some of the writing on there is, is quite small, but it's just getting across the, the concepts is what, we're, what I'm trying to do. Um, so here's that. This is Nestle, um, if that's not clear. So this is their roadmap. So on the surface, this this all looks all looks great with the things I've been talking about. So um, and here's the curve that we that we saw earlier. So emissions increasing and then and then start to reduce. And so here's the date. So you've got a 2025 date. So there's an interim target. Uh, there's another interim target for 2030, reduce emissions by 50 percent. Uh, and then here's so the roadmap and the plan is up here, how they're going to do it. So this this all looks fantastic. Um, plant 200 million trees. Um, so on, on one level, this this is great. Uh, and but when you look at it, maybe in a slightly more detail, um, just to highlight a couple of sort of things I've alluded to. So planting 200 million trees. This is the the point about offsetting. Um, not not everybody could plant 200 million trees. Is that thing where are you going to put them all? I think is a valid question. But that is not to say that, that that shouldn't be part of Nestle's plan. It's just this sort of broader, broader thinking. But the real point I think on here um, is is all the all the news uh, and the plan is is great. I'm not saying it's not. Uh, it runs to 2030, and then after that, it, it it's kind of not much. Um, so 15% by 2030, and then uh, we'll just deliver on our promise and get to net zero by 2050. So I, I just think that it's just a really interesting way of looking at it. And I, I think it's true to say that other companies are a bit like that. It's not to sort of to blame any anybody, but there's this sort of it, it's those easy wins. It, 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 you can get to 2030, you can reduce by 50 percent. That's not going to be too hard. Um, but what happens after that? You know, um, it, it's a little bit a little bit unplanned. And, and you see comments like um, I think. I think it's up here. But there's sort of talk of investing in solutions, and the solutions aren't always defined. It's 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 a bit better here, but but it's fairly common to see that sort of thing. So we're investing in carbon capture, but that's sort of slightly unproven. And if that's the sort of central part of your plan, then it's then it yeah, it, it doesn't look too robust. But always with that caveat that um, this this isn't a bad plan, you know, that, and and they all have to do something, and and they're all working on it. But it's just something to sort of to bear in mind. So, yeah, I thought hopefully that was an interesting example. Um, then moving on to just a little bit more on, on reductions in residuals, sort of sort of hammering the point home a bit, um, as I like to do. So yeah, is it there's got to be an interim target? Is it science based? Um, again, is that great? It's a great term. You know, it sounds really good if it's science based. And you know, what does that mean? So there, there are um, definitions fairly obviously of that. One of them. Um, so in linear terms, it's a two and a half percent reduction in emissions. That's for two degrees. Um, for one and a half degrees, four point two percent annual linear reduction. So it's quite a significant difference just for that half degree um, difference in temp implied temperature rise. Um, so yeah, won't go into all the into the out of that, but yeah, there's obviously quite a lot of work there on, on what is science based and what isn't. Um, is there an interim target for scope three? So this is one of the things that we're looking for in particular, um, because scope three can be so important. It can be the majority of emissions for the company. So it's one of those um, signs. So is the company um, paying attention or, or or doing the job properly? I suppose is the, the only way to really put it. Um, how are they considering scope three and have they set that interim target for it, acknowledging that it's difficult, like we said. Um, and then, yeah, on the residual emissions, I, I think I mentioned this one. Uh, has the company sort of got that far? Has they thought, OK, when well, we've done all this work, there's still going to be X amount of emissions that we can't do anything about. And let's think about what we're going to do about those. Um, yeah, is there that plan for the, for their removal on the last point there? So um, another example. So this is good old Apple. Um, so just a couple of things to pull out. Um, so one of them is, is on the terminology. So on the left here. So this is um, is this is from 
2020, I think, this commitment, but it, it's just to sort of illustrate the point of, of what, how companies can use the language. So Apple commits to be 100% carbon neutral um, for its supply chain products by 2030. So that's um, on the surface looks great, but they're using the phrase carbon neutral. We've talked about what that means, but then if you read the small text at the bottom, so they're already carbon neutral today. The company plans to bring its entire carbon footprint to net zero uh, 20 years sooner than IPCC, so, so in 2030. So they've used the term interchangeably, carbon neutral and net zero. And as we have talked about, it's it's really it really means a different thing. Um, but that's not to say Apple is is in any way um, bad. They're actually very good, and and I think what they are talking about is net zero rather than being carbon neutral. Because if if you look in their roadmap, so that's on the right here, um, they're reducing emissions by seventy five percent. And then the second point. Car, so carbon removal. So, so this is where they have calculated their likely residual emissions. So they think they will need so up to twenty five percent of the. So this is the whole um, value chain. Twenty five percent remaining will need to be removed. So that again is what is what you want to see. Um, and they acknowledge that that may be difficult. And they, they so they mention carbon offset as a as an interim solution. So that so that's um, yeah I I think that that's interesting in terms of, of what we're trying to do with our information so so it's sort of teasing out what's really going on so the, yeah they've used a confusing terminology but what's really going on is is, is very good and they've thought about uh, everything they need to okay I mentioned memberships earlier so this is another thing that the ethical screening analysis looks at as part of this yep yeah, i said collaboration and transparency there are a lot of um things you can join um how we do these things um in terms of um is it sort of slightly promotion related you know everyone um, i'm being cynical everyone sort of jumps on the bandwagon um and it's all about the actions really so but but yeah i think you know most of these are are true and have good intentions and you have probably heard of, of most of them so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail but science-based targets initiative um, have a large number of companies signed up now and they've worked on the net zero standard um, to you fans that cargo financial and alliance for net zero is called that because it I think they came out of COP26 yes it did because that, that was in Glasgow so that's the origin of that um, and there are all sorts of net zero asset managers initiative, net zero insurers initiatives that companies can sign up to. But yeah, but good things all, all about um, transparency, etc. And there's some specific ones for I think RE100, which is um, one that is here is so that's um, renewable energy 100. So committing to get 100% energy from re uh, from renewables. So yeah, another part of uh, of what we look at. Okay, so I'm just taking the time. Um, I've got a couple more slides with examples left, and and then we're done. And so yeah, two slides. The first one compares two similar companies doing things differently. So a couple of airlines, and the second one is just comparing two two slightly random companies but that again are doing things differently so just to sort of illustrate what what we see so easyjet has uh taken these on board in more of a doing things properly if i can use that phrase so they have committed to net zero carbon by 2050 which is pretty bold for an airline i suppose we could say um they have a science-based target for 2030 so there's your interim target it has been verified by the SPTI it so the well to wake is is like a, a more of a life cycle analysis on the on the fuel um, so that is to get their greenhouse gas emissions related to jet fuel yeah it, it is all part of it so so they're really thinking about the problem and Picking up on, on other things I've said, so their plan for residuals, they do have this plan to use direct air carbon capture and storage. Um, 
that is one of the techniques. Um, so it's investing in the technology to uh, to achieve that. So um, yeah, one of those you can see sort of good or bad. Um, they're good that they're investing in it. Um, sort of bad. It, well, there's not much you can do about it. There's this sort of reliance to achieve net zero. This reliance on technology that isn't actually sort of there or, or proven yet. But you know you, you need to do something. So investing in it is all very good. So that's easy jet. Wizz Air is, so we've got a good and a bad one here, really, fairly obviously. Um, Wizz Air has no fixed commitment. Um, they've said there's an aspiration for 2050. They haven't, haven't gone that far. Uh, they're committed to setting science-based targets. Um, so they're, they're obviously looking at it, um, but they haven't gone as far as this as the commitment, like I said. So they, there is no plan for their residual emissions. They just haven't haven't got that far. So again, just illustrating that, yeah, companies at different points. Okay, so yes, two more examples for you. Um, AstraZeneca, so this is an um, example of a, a sort of textbook example. So a company doing, doing it all right, I guess, um, everything you'd expect. So they have net zero greenhouse gas by 2026 20, scope one and two. So that's a very specific target. And scope three by 2045. So that's sort of looks like a fairly realistic date. Also in before 2050. So that's that's a very strong commitment. Uh, yeah, they they've made these near and long term science. So it's all science based, and it covers all their emissions. So they're ticking the the target box, and they have gone into the the plan for residuals. So they're using the one of the other um, one of the other acronyms, one of the other techniques. So this bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Um, but again, they they've thought about it, and this is all part of their plan. And they use the phrase high quality. Um, and they also they go a little bit further, which um, they say intention to be carbon negative from 2030. So that's that's very bold. So we'll remove more CO2 from the atmosphere than it than it emits. So. So yeah, AstraZeneca really a company doing sort of as much as you can be expected in this area. And then um, I'll flip it around to, I, I just found Caterpillar, which is one that um, is not saying they're, they're not doing anything, but again, a bit like was there before. Um, it's like they're sort of starting on the on the journey there. They, they've acknowledged something's going on, but they haven't put that resort in and, and um, gone into the details. So they support the goals of the Paris Agreement. Again, that's a, a fairly easy thing to say, um, but they do have a target to reduce scope one and two, as is on the screen there, thirty percent by twenty thirty. So that, I mean, that that in itself is, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, compared to to other companies, they're sort of starting on their journey, uh, and they haven't sort of looked at residuals or or any plan for their removals. So that gives you, a, hopefully, gives you a flavour of of what is going on and the differences and what we're looking at. So yeah, that, that is my final slide. Um, I don't have a concluding slide. <laughs> How do we conclude? Um, I think I've probably said more than once that you know, there's good and bad going on. Um, I think the, the, the progress that's being made, if you think about those dates again, 2018 is not, it's not that long ago. Everybody does need to move very fast with this. That's very widely acknowledged. And companies are doing a lot. Certainly some companies really take it on board and, and making progress, not and as we've seen, not not all of them, but um so yeah, there's there's sort of very good news, but it, you, you don't <laughs> if you look at the bigger picture and emissions are still increasing, um then yeah, you, you can start to feel a bit negative about it. But I think yeah, the bigger picture, there there's a lot going on. So I think there's some optimism there. So I'll leave it on. On that note, a hopefully optimistic note.